So, welcome to Lou. Uh, we're recording now. Um, okay, go ahead. Okay, I'll share screen here. And find thing. Right. So, I'm going to be talking about virtual not cobordism and its relationship with uh, uh, Kavana phomology. So let me begin by telling you about virtual not cobordism. Uh, one way to think about not cobordism classically uh, is to add uh, the following moves to uh, to the Reitermeister moves and think about what that does to the knots. And the moves are, you can go through a saddle point, uh, an oriented saddle point. That is, if you have a diagram like this, you can replace by reconnecting it in this fashion or the other way around. Uh, and uh, you can then also allow births and deaths, uh, depending on which way you think time is going. Um, where a, a trivial circle is removed from the diagram. And of course, these are elementary cobordisms in three space cross the unit interval or three space cross R. And so give surfaces in four space that the knot bounds. And you can see that for a classical knot, any, any knot will bound a surface in four space. And we'll see how that uh, looks for virtual knots as well. But when we're working with virtual knots, we don't have to worry about what surface in what four space is being talked about if we don't want to, because just as in the classical theory, you can think the following way. I allow these kinds of replacements in the diagrams. I think about the surfaces that they would trace and catalog the genus involved. So for example, this is a good example. Oh, by the way, do you see my pointer when I move it around? Yes. Good, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, we do, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm uh, always, sometimes uh, people see it and sometimes they don't. Anyway, so uh, for example, here's a, a cobordism that starts with a trivial circle um, and goes through a saddle point, giving birth to two circles, and then go and then there's a death, uh, and then we're back to a single circle again. Um, and um, I can and I can see that that has genus zero. And on the other hand, if I go through uh, a saddle point and uh, and then I go through another saddle point then I generated some genus in the process. And so we can check what genus surface we've generated through a cobordism without um, actually worrying about the four space. We just look at the surface abstractly generated and ask what's its genus. And then classically or virtually, you can ask what's the least genus that can be generated by a cobordism. So in a virtual situation, and I'm not going to repeat the definitions of virtual knots, but I do recall for you that uh, a virtual knot diagram has virtual crossings like this one. And the virtual crossing is actually a detour or connection between two points, and that's all it means. So it can be interpreted as uh, a detour up through a handle attached to the plane and back down into the plane if you want to. It can be uh, interpreted as a way of explaining that the knot is in, a, is, in the, is in some higher genus surface cross a unit interval thickened like that if you want. But, but because it's simply a connection from the point of view of the diagrammatic theory, this means that the exact genus on which the, in which the virtual knot lives is, that's a different genus from this four ball genus. That genus is not specified because every time you change the configuration of connections, you may change the genus of the surface. In any case, here is a virtual stevedores knot, I call it. Um, and like the classical stevedores knot, it happens to be a slice knot in this 
virtual cobordism category. And uh, here's the proof. We, uh, we put in a virtual crossing here um, so that these two lines are in oppositely oriented position and go through a saddle point. And now you see that there is a detour connection which goes all the way up around to here. And so that means that these two points can be reconnected directly like that. That's a virtual move. And now you look at this and you see that it is an unlink and comes apart and those two circles can go away. And so the pattern, the genus generating pattern is circle through saddle to two circles that each bound and so the virtual skivador is a slice knot in the virtual category. Or I will say it bounds a disk in virtual four space. And if you do a little more work with this knot, you can show uh, that it indeed is a virtual knot and uh, not a classical knot. And so this gives a good example of the slicing phenomenon happening in the virtual category. And one would like to understand the slice that one would like to understand the cobordism classes of virtual knots in the same way that we begin to understand the cobordism classes of classical knots. Oh, I see I have a slide here indicating how I know that the virtual stevedore is not classical. Um, I won't bother you with it. Um, here is a well-known kind of cobordism that uh, we know from classical situation, and it works just as well for virtual. So I take uh, a virtual diagram at its mirror image, and I have set up its mirror image in such a way that it is mirrored across a plane perpendicular to the writing plane, and I have reversed its orientation so that I can take the connected sum. So here I have the connected sum of the knot and its mirror image. And we're going to see that this is slice. And one way to see that it's slice is to go through appropriate saddle points. So I go through a saddle point here, and then that releases these two to go through a saddle point. And having examined, and then examine this one, and you will see that uh, it comes apart by virtual moves into a collection of three circles that are trivial. And that makes it into a slice knot. And this generalizes so that you have that, just as you do for classical knots, you have that the connected sum of a knot and its mirror image is slice. Now, what about spanning surfaces and surfaces that bound in the virtual four ball? Well, um, the classical spanning surface that we all know is the cipher circle span cipher spanning surface, which is obtained by making cipher circles. So when you do that to a classical diagram, you smooth the or you take an oriented smoothing of each crossing, you get a collection of circles. You bound each circle by a disk and put back in the twists at the crossings and you find an orientable surface whose boundary is the knot. Here is a cobordism way of thinking about the same surface. At every crossing, I will go through a saddle point along the two, unori two oppositely oriented edges coming into the crossing like that. And you see, this gives me a set of cipher circles with little twists on them. Um, and, um, and then I'll bound them with disks and be gone. I have a circle, I have a surface whose boundary is the knot. But now I've described a surface whose boundary is the knot, which is embedded into the four ball, because first I took a, a saddles, which brought this, this one down into a concentric three sphere uh, to the or usual three sphere. And then I do some isotopies, moving the three sphere down a little more. And, uh, and then I bound off with the disks. And so I have described 
a um, uh, a surface bounding the knot either in the four ball or in uh, S three cross the unit interval, whichever way you want to think about it. So this is a a nice way to think about what it is. What is a cobordism picture of the ciphered surface pushed gently into the four ball, leaving the boundary fixed in the three sphere? That's a classical picture, but that classical picture uh, generalizes to virtuals, you see, because I can go through the same cobordisms getting a set of virtual cyphered circles like this. One cycle circle comes out of the truffle knot this way and then bound that. Um, and that gives me a cobordism surface whose boundary is the truffle knot, which I'll call the virtual cyphered surface for the truffle knot. Um, and you can calculate the genus of that surface. The genus is one half of minus the number of ciphered circles plus the number of classical crossings plus one, as is easy to see by an Euler characteristic argument. So we know that genus. Um, we know that genus. Um, and, uh, and so we, that, that proves to us that every virtual knot bounds uh, some surface in the four ball that way. And we have a specific genus, which um, uh, it, it may be the actual genus of the, of the knot can be much smaller than that, but this gets a bound. And so uh, the question is, what is the oh, genus? Oh, is uh, can I just interrupt a moment? Um, is that noise coming from your place? I'm afraid it is. Uh, they yeah. are doing some uh, work on the outside of the building. Yeah, no, and no I problem. Can't... I, I just thought if it was someone else that I'd ask them to mute. <laughs> but mm, we yes. can't mute you, obviously. I, I wish it were avoidable. Yeah, yeah. But, sorry about that. Uh, so, um, so, that's, so this is a nice uh, cipher surface to think about for virtual knots. But by the way... Um, it isn't the kind of ciphered surface where you could do the ciphered pairing and go on in that kind of classical direction with the virtual knots if you're thinking of them embedded in a thickened surface. That you can also do if the knot bounds a surface in the thickened surface um, or partially bounds, um, taking some components to the boundary. And that is another possibility. Um, can I ask you a question, Roger? Um, did you give me complete host or partial host? You're, because you're host. I'm getting I'm getting admissions, uh, which I'm admitting. I, I, but yeah, I'm, if I'm you could take up the admitting, uh, then I will. I, I, I'm happy to take up the admitting. Okay, yeah. great. Um, okay, so there we are with that. Um, this is a picture of what I was just saying in the case of the virtual trefoil, we go through, but here I've done it one saddle point at the time, one saddle point, and I have two, another saddle point, uh, and I'm back to the, the one that was the virtual, yeah, and, and bound off with a disc. So this is maybe a slightly different story than the one I just told you with the virtual cipher surface, but in this case, it's producing a genus one surface. So uh, to make a long story short, um, a while back, Heather and Aaron and I proved a generalization of the Rasmussen theorem, which gives the four-ball genus of a positive virtual knot, whereby four-ball genus, I mean four-ball genus in this virtual sense. And we find that if you have a positive virtual knot, all the crossings are all the classical crossings are positive, then the four ball genus is in fact equal to the virtual cipher genus. So that's a specific formula, one half of minus the number of circles plus the number of crossings plus one for the virtual knot. Um, and we prove this by using a generalization of Kovanov and Lee homology for virtual knots and generalizing the Rasmussen invariant. So this talk is going to be a um, 
a, a little tour through the definition of, of Kavana and virtual Kavana phomology and a sketch of how this argument works. So I'm going to go back to the beginning and remind you about virtual Kovana phomology. But um, if it seems to me that I'm uh, spending too much time on some point, uh, I will jump. But let's begin at the beginning. I know you've seen these definitions before, but part of the problem is I want to remind you of it in a way that I can then speak about how one tries to generalize Kovana phomology for virtual knots. And that's an interesting story, which begins with definitions that Vasily Manturov made a while back, and, um, and we'll tell the story. So we're starting with the bracket polynomial. And I remind you that it works this way. It has a skein relation that's a recursive expansion. Um, and if there's an extra loop, uh, then you multiply by an appropriate factor that makes things regularly isotopy invariant. And then in the framing parts, it multiplies in a simple way, and that can be normalized to make a model of the Jones polynomial. Um, for virtuals, <coughs> the formulas are exactly the same. Not all invariants generalize to virtuals easily, but this one certainly does. You just do it exactly the same way, only when you have a, 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 an extra circle, it could have virtual crossings and you ignore them. Um, you don't have to ignore the virtual crossings. You don't have to ignore the extra structure that might be there. There's a lot of ways of putting in more structure than the bracket polynomial to get invariance of virtuals, but we're going to work with the basic bracket polynomial. Um, and then there is the collection of states of the bracket polynomial um, looked at as a cube uh, with arrows going from states that have a certain number of A smoothings to another state that has one more B smoothing. Uh, uh, maybe this is this diagram would be better seen uh, horizontally, but I won't turn it just now. Uh, one usually thinks of going from left to right with all the A's on the left and all the B's on the right. And these tiers that I'm seeing have one B and then two B's and three B's and so on. And this is a category or generates a category with each of these arrows being a generating morphism. And you turn this diagram of states into a category by putting in identity morphisms at each of the little diagrams, allowing composition of arrows. Um, and then you have a category. Um, the basic idea of Kovana phomology is to put it bluntly, here's a category, why don't I take the homology of this category in some form and see whether I can get an invariant of the knot out of that idea. Uh, and remarkably, it works. Um, the, the Kovana phomology method of taking homology of this category, since it's cubic and has a particularly nice way of doing that, is to take is to think of each of these tiers as giving rise to a direct sum of of modules. If there is a module associated to each one of the objects in this category, take a direct sum of modules along each one of these tiers. And that will be the first chain, the the the, um, the zeroth chain group, the first chain group, the second chain group, and the third chain group as you go on down. Uh, and then the collection of arrows that goes from one tier to the next tier is summed with appropriate signs to give a boundary mapping from one tier to the next. And uh, this works. This formalism works very generally, um, but for knots. If you choose the right module, you can get an invariant of knots and links out of it. So, uh, getting so I want to remind you of the of the uh, 
um, uh, method by which I'm going to do this. Now, one of the first things that Kovanov did uh, for grading reasons and other reasons that are become apparent is he rewrote the bracket in the form that you see here. So instead of writing A times this plus B times that, um, uh, essentially you're multiplying by a power of A across the entire bracket, which, which can be thought of as locally eliminating the A on the A smoothing. So I still speak of A and B smoothings, but now we're using Q and Q multiplies a B smoothing. And the value of the loop is now algebraically pleasant. It's Q plus Q inverse. And the value of a loop next to the knot is Q plus Q inverse times the value of the knot. Um, so, so there's a hint here of, um, of the way we're going to think about the states in this formula. Because you see the value of the loop is Q plus Q inverse, as though the loop were really two loops, one being evaluated with Q and the other evaluated with Q inverse. So why not do that? And um, Vero made that quite explicit a, a while back. He said, why not label the loop with a plus and, and another label for a minus? This idea is already present in models for Homply polynomial and other things, uh, but it, it works very well here to keep track of things. So we will do that, um, but I guess I didn't do that on the next slide. So I'll, I'll, just, I'll just jump a little bit back to what happens when we use this Q version of the uh, bracket. When you use this Q version of the bracket, you get uh, some different invariances under the moves. You get the peculiar looking Q inverse or minus Q squared under the first Reitermeister moves. Under the second Reitermeister move, you find that it multiplies by minus Q. And under the third Reitermeister move, it's invariant. But then you can normalize this directly just as you did the bracket. And, uh, and then the normalization looks like this. So you have this pleasant, uh, pleasant uh, expansion for the bracket with the Q, and you find that you get a fully invariant polynomial by multiplying by the following, minus one to the number of negative crossings, Q to the number of positive minus twice the number of negative. That's the normalization that you need. And um, if that looks strange to you, you can, um, you can become... Um, you can become familiar with it by examining what that does to renormalize these variances here and see that indeed it works exactly right to make something invariant under all three Reitermeister moves. And, uh, and then you are looking directly at the Jones polynomial by a simple substitution. So as I started to say, We'll use enhanced states by labeling each loop with a plus one or a minus one like that. And then the value of the loop is Q plus Q inverse Q for plus Q inverse for minus. And if you have more loops, um, why then uh, you'll have more states. So if you have two loops, you'll have four states. And if you add up everything that contributed there, you'll see that it's Q plus Q inverse squared, just as you expected it to be. Um, and so the binomial theorem uh, has been um, absorbed into this labeling of states with pluses and minuses, these enhanced states. And then there's one further notational bit, which is, um, which is because of algebra we're about to do, we'll label loops with a minus one by an X and we'll label loops by a plus one with a one. And now, now the bracket looks like this. It's a sum of minus one to the number of B states because remember we had a minus Q in the expansion. I remind you, you have a minus Q. So if you expand this in terms of states, you'll get a minus Q to the number of B smoothings. And that will be, that will be minus one to the number of B smoothings, and then there'll be a power of Q. But the power of Q isn't just the number of B smoothings. It's also uh, um, Q to the plus one and Q to the minus one coming in from the loops. 
So that lambda is equal to the number of positive loops minus the number of negative loops. And then you have a monomial expansion of the bracket in terms of these states. And with the monomial expansion of the bracket, um, you can, it's convenient for thinking about the bracket. You can think about cancellation in the bracket and other things by using the monomial expansion. Um, and if we want to think about such matters, even if we weren't aiming toward Quvana homology, it would be natural to count the number of states that have a given I and a given J, where I is NB and J is what I just defined. So I can sum over those states that have a given I and a given J, minus one to the I, Q to the J. And then counting them together, all together, the ones with a given I and a given J, I'll make a module out of them, which I'll call CIJ, uh, a module generated by the enhanced states with a given I and a given J, and I'll take its dimension, and that just counts how many there were. But now uh, the formula for the bracket is beginning to look something like a graded Euler characteristic, because you see that... Um, I could regard this as the sum over Q to the J times the sum on I of minus one to the I, Cij. And that has the flavor of uh, an Euler characteristic of a complex C with an index J. So if you, could if you can write down a differential that goes from Cij to Ci plus one J, leaving the J fixed, then this would be a graded Euler characteristic. And of course, as I said, we're going to have the boundaries generated by smoothing A's into B's. So uh, if we did that, I would rewrite the bracket this way, Q to the J and a sum on I, and that sum on I is the other characteristic of this putative chain complex, which we're going to construct in a moment. Um, and, um, and then... Uh, then the formula for the bracket becomes sum on J, Q to the J, or the characteristic of the Jth chain complex. And so in the best of all possible worlds, we want this chain complex, we want chain complexes indexed by J, separate ones, separate homologies, and each one is, has its or the characteristic, and that sum will give the bracket, and that means that the coefficients of the bracket in this form are going to be all the characteristics of homologies and and invariant and the homologies themselves are going to turn out to be invariant so that could have you could imagine that as a dream of somebody fiddling around with this but kovanov realized that dream a while back um so the boundary is going to be sum of partial differentials corresponding to re-smoothings um we have issues there uh, the issues are uh, that when you re-smooth a loop with a self-site, uh, uh, it becomes two. And when you re-smooth two loops that are joined at an, at an A, they become one. So that means that from the point of view of modules assigned to the loops, uh, you need to have a mapping from a module to the tensor product of the module with itself or from the tensor product to the module a multiplication and a co-multiplication. And then it turns out that Kovanov's original answer is the following, that the co-multiplication of X, remember X, it corresponded to minus one labeling a loop, um, will be X tensor X, and the co-multiplication of one will be one tensor X plus X tensor one, and the square of X will be equal to zero. Um, if you do that, you will get a very compatible algebra. And this turns out to be a Frobenius algebra, which definition I probably will not make. So, um, so what you can see if you use this algebra is that it's compatible with changes of cobordism because you can think of going from one state to another by going through a little cobordism um, so that the multiplication is a co can be thought of as a cobordism from two to one and the co-multiplication as a cobordism from one to two. And then there are other things that might happen. So for example, you may have two possibilities. You might have the, have the possibility of, of going through 
a multiplication and then a co-multiplication, or you might do it in the opposite order, and you will get um, you will get different surfaces that are homeomorphic. Those different surfaces that are homeomorphic correspond in the complex of doing a partial differential in one order or a partial dif two partial differentials in the other order. We would like them to be the same because if back in the complex, and excuse me, I'm going to slide back my slides to the complex for a moment, back in the complex that we're thinking about here, sorry. Back in the complex that we're thinking about here, if you did a partial differential and then another one, or you did it in the opposite order, you would land in the same place. And if it should be that they're equal algebraically, then you are in a position to say that the iterated differential that you make by doing the sum of all these maps and the sum of all these maps will be zero mod two at least, and then by adding signs integrally. So, um, so one would like that all these apparently commuting squares in the category will be taken over by this functor to the module category in such a way that everybody commutes. And the Frobenius algebra, the one that we're looking at, satisfies that condition and thereby gives what we want. And furthermore, it does what we want in terms of leaving J fix. Now, did I illustrate it? I believe I did. I'll come back to that one. Yeah, here's an illustration for you. So remember that the generators of the module are the enhanced states themselves. So looked at this way, we put our attention on a state, label it with some labels, and it becomes an algebra element in the module. So this guy here, for example, is X tensor X, um, excuse me, one tensor one. And this guy here is one tensor X, and this is X tensor X. Um, and, um, and if I multiply by my rules, this is one times one is one. And you see what happened is that the number of Bs went up by one and the lambda went down by one. And number of Bs plus lambda is remaining constant. That's J remaining constant. Here, lambda is zero. There's one plus and one minus. But X time, one times X is X. So lambda here is minus one. Um, and it went down by one, but the number of Bs went up by one. And that by that principle, J remains fixed, and these work. Um, when you get to, why is X squared equal to zero? Well, when you take minus and minus, you would like the lambda to go down, but minus two is the lowest lambda locally available to you. So you just call it zero and get rid of it. Um, and for the product, similarly, X, X tensor X here, Lambda is minus two, it went down appropriately. So delta of x equals x tensor x. And for the one, um, the one has lambda equals one, you want it to go down to zero, so you need a one and an x. And nobody told you that, that there was any order, so we'd best add them. So at this point, you add, uh, and you get this coproduct. So there's the coproduct uh, and the product. And then, as I was saying, there is this compatibility, and the compatibility corresponds to, let's just look at this one slide and skip the others. <clears throat> I might, um, I might uh, in this case, do the saddle first, uh, doing a coproduct, and then I'll do this one here, which is a coproduct. So I did a product, and then I did a coproduct, and I go from here to here. That's going around one side of a square in the category. Here's going around the same square in the other direction. Uh, I decided to do the coproduct first, and then I did the product. And you see how the surfaces are homeomorphic. So uh, another way of putting that, thinking back to the category, is that if you, if you, um, if you think of the morphisms in the category as little cobordisms going along the arrows, then everything is fine. You can take the cobordisms up to homeomorphism of the surfaces generated. Anyway, um, 
let's see what happened if these were labeled one. If these are labeled one and we multiply, we get one, and then we co-multiply and we get one tensor X plus X tensor one. Over here, I'm going to do the co-product on one here. Sorry, it's illegible. But I get one tensor X plus X tensor one, and then over here, a one came down. So that's tensored with one. But then I'm multiplying on the... Uh, I'm multiplying on the um, a second uh, tensor factor over here, and that means x times one and one times x. And so we get the same result. Um, and uh, you can, uh, for yourself, enjoy the miracle that this algebra works perfectly for all the different surfaces involved um, uh, and check a number of things and see that everything is working and we really do have a chain complex as a result. So that's the, the definition of Kovana homology, except for one little important detail, which is this. How do we get the signs? We've got it all working without worrying about the signs, but we want that, uh, we want that going around one side of a cube should be the same as minus going around the other side of the cube. We want the signs to work out. And here, the moral is more or less simplicial. You can think of, um, of, a, of an element um, along the line um, as a sequence of A's and B's, because that's, that's abstractly what you have in this cube category. At a given vertex in the cube category, you can think of the object as being some string of A's and B's having ordered the crossings. And then when you take a boundary, you change an A to a B, you change an A to a B, and you change an A to a B. And once you've ordered them, then you can say, okay, I will change the first A to a B, I'll change the second A to a minus, and the third A to a plus, just like you usually do with simplices. But on the other hand, if there were already a B there, you should ignore it because Bs don't get operated on any further. So this looks like two A's, and the first one when you change it is plus, and the next one when you change it is minus. So the rule is minus one to the number of A's preceding that A to be smooth. And then you get uh, uh, an integral boundary with boundary boundary equals zero. And now we have defined Kovana homology. Um, the cobordism structure is important. I mean, the cobordism of state structure is very important for understanding what's going on here. Um, you can add a bit of algebra to the situation, namely, you want to talk about what happens when somebody dies out or uh, when somebody is born. Um, and um, if you have an A in the module, then you should have an epsilon of A in the ground ring. Uh, and if you have an element one, an element in the ground ring, you should have an element in the module. This is unit and is de defined by taking one to the element in the module. Um, on the other hand, epsilon uh, needs to be defined. And to find out what happens to each of these, epsilon and one, um, you watch a few cobordisms to see what happens. So for example, here I start with A and it goes to delta of A, some sum of tensor products, and then I apply epsilon. Um, and so I get the result and that's supposed to be equal to A. If I start with, well, to make a long story short, you do a little calculation like that, and you find out that epsilon of one should be zero and epsilon of X should be one in order for the thing to extend. And, and now you're really in the uh, structure of what's called a Frobenius algebra. Um, and, and then you can find out what happens to little closed surfaces. So for example, if you started with a sphere and went down through, you, you see you're going to have a one from, from the co-unit and then you apply epsilon, but epsilon of one is zero. So the value of a two sphere is zero. The value of a torus is two by this method. You go one, one, co-product, multiply, get two X, uh, take the epsilon and epsilon of X is one. And so you find that you get the value of two for 
two-dimensional tor for a torus. But if you try higher genus surfaces, they're all zero. So the evaluations of little cobordisms that are going on in this complex um, are actually very simple, uh, and uh, that's important. So now I want to skip these, this talk about the cube category. And and I don't think I want to say that out loud, but I want to give you an indication of what happens under the Rademeister 2 move when you think this way, okay? So just to give you an idea, oh, I see, we're running out of time, but... Uh, let me let me make this remark, and then I will skip forward to the rest of the story about how you make virtual Kovana homology. But this is the question: What happens under a Reitermeister two move? Okay, we could think of Reitermeister three as well. But what happens? Um, the category kind of blows up a bit, as you see. Here is here is a Reitermeister two configuration, and here are all the smoothings locally that happen from it. And the category that you got out of that then blows up into having this, and uh, and then everywhere else there are all the things that could have that already were in the category, copies of things going around like that. And you want to see that you could you could compare these two categories: the simpler category for the pulled apart move, and the more complicated category for the Rademeister II configuration, and you want to see that you get the same homology groups. Well, in fact, what, what you get is that you get chain homotopy equivalent complexes. So thinking in terms of the complexes, the categories simplify because you have a direct sum of these two pieces. And so this is, looks like a little piece of chain complex going from left to right thing going to the sum of these, going to that. Um, and, uh, and you want to produce a chain homotopy equivalence between these two categories, um, between these two chain complexes. But you can think cobordism maps and category if you want to just as well. Um, you don't have to worry the algebra too much. You want to think about what you can give birth to and what can be removed. And to get a chain homotopy equivalence, you need a homotopy, chain homotopy. Chain homotopies go against the line of direction of the chain complex. And H2 and H1 are, are, are possible choices for a chain homotopy here. In the comparison, the comparison to the upper one is just uh, essentially an identity because the upper one and the lower one look alike. I won't detail it further. So it's along the lower line between this lower line part here and this part here that you need to see a chain homotopy. Um, and then you say to yourself, well, how could I produce, this is Drawer's uh, heuristics uh, in his paper on tangle cobordisms. <coughs> how would I produce this chain homotopy? Could I do it perhaps just geometrically, just topologically. Well, how do I get from here to here? Give birth to a circle. And how do I get from here to here? Let that circle die out. And the answers turn out to be, yeah, that's it. That's a chain homotopy if something were true. And the if were true, if you go through the diagrammatics of this calculation, and I shan't, are... But you see, this is what it's looking like, different pieces, and you fit them together. And to get a chain homotopy, you need that a composition plus an identity, uh, I'm working on two in my di diagram, should be equal to the DH and the HD. So this is the formula for the chain homotopy. And then you shade your eyes um, and throw away everything, all the algebra that you wrote, and look at the cobordism equation that you got. And you see that it's a certain relationship. Um, it says that I have four bits of surface here, and I shall tube them in pairs. I'll tube these two, I'll tube these two, I'll tube these two, and I'll tube these two. And if you order it correctly, one, two, three, four, then it's tube one and two, minus tube two and three, plus tube three and four, minus tube one and four. Um, 
and that should be equal to zero. It's a kind of cocycle condition. Well, Dror calls that the four two relation, four tube relation, and it turns out that it's true about the algebra that I just showed you. And that's the core of why this thing ends up being invariant under Reitermeister moves. It's amazing. Um, it's also amazing that you could just say in the most abstract way, I shall impose this relationship on my uh, category of little cobordisms between uh, objects in the Kovanov category made additive. And then you would have an abstract chain homotopy equivalence invariant of the abstract chain homotopy equivalence type of the abstract chain complex that you had defined. So you can think of the Kovana homology as an enti entirely some uh, formal uh, invariant uh, uh, coming from um, controlling these cobordisms correctly. So that's very interesting and we can go on. And then we can go on from there and find out what algebras would work if we started with this relation, for two relation, and ask, well, what algebra would, would be compatible with having this? And then you will reinvent the algebra that I just told you. Uh, and I won't go through that either. Um, but if you go through the reinvention, the reinvention gets you a more general algebra. Uh, the reinvention gets you that you could have x squared equal to a constant, epsilon of x is 1, epsilon of 1 is 0, delta 1 is 1 tensor x plus x tensor 1, and that constant uh, appears in delta of x. And then at k equals 0, this is the Kovanov algebra. At k equals 1, this is an algebra investigated by Yu Sun Li, who shows that it is also a homology theory. And then it turns out that the Lie algebra and the Kovanov algebra are intimately related to one another. Um, and Rasmussen defines an, an invariant, which starts with elements in the Lie algebra, compares them with where they are in the Kovanov situation, and gets very subtle information about links and knots up to cobordism. Uh, by using cobordism in the other way that I've been describing. And, and we want to talk about, in the last few minutes here, I see, how you generalize this structure to virtual knots. So these notes that I prepared, are, uh, which you might find useful, are, um, are talking about the rest of the story of how the Lie algebra can be configured. And I do want to mention this about the Lie algebra, so we'll go for a few minutes about that. Um, and that is this. The Lie algebra looks like this, but can be rewritten in the following way. You let R be 1 plus x over 2 and G be 1 minus x over 2. And then the algebra uh, looks like red and green here. Red squared is red. Green squared is green. Rg is 0. And the coproduct of R is 2R tensor R. And the coproduct of G is minus 2G tensor G. This is good. Uh, for working with it, uh, and we'll see later in a, a little bit about that. So, so then it turns out that the Lie algebra can give you cycles by appropriately labeling the ciphered circles of a classical knot. You get it so that you have alternating red and green uh, in the interactions of the ciphered circles. And remember, red time the ciphered circles uh, are not uh, touching themselves, and so the boundary of this is zero. Red times green is zero. So you, you actually, in the Lie algebra, see some visually, diagrammatically, a lot of cycles. And those cycles are what uh, enable this comparison between Lie homology and Kovana homology to um, be used by Rasmussen to Rasmussen invariant to prove things like the genus of positive classical knots. It comes from this coloring trick and the Lie algebra. And uh, so that's the, that's the general setup there. And now what is the problem if you go to 
virtuals. Well, here it is. Look at this guy here. And notice what happens if I, uh, if I re-smooth this. I get a single cycle. I, I started with a single cycle state, and I end with a single cycle state. So along with co-product and product, you also have a single cycle map. And you need to handle it. And the way Montour decided to handle it is to take it to be zero. But then that gives some problems in its wake. And you're looking at that problem here in this generic case. Uh, single cycle map, single cycle map. Composition of two of them is zero. Going around the other way, I have a coproduct and a product. And if I compose co-product with product, say one, one tensor X plus X tensor one, and then back multiply and add, I get two X. Two X is not equal to zero, but two X is equal to zero mod two. Okay, good. We'll do it mod two, but we'd like to do it integrally. And uh, that's the problem. How do you do this scheme integrally? In five minutes well sorry i uh i think i assume you can do it in what uh well about the but i i want to show you how it's done integrally um i want to show you the idea okay okay um and um and so um i'm going to tell you what 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 we do uh and what we what I'm going to show you the formula um, because in this context you have heard this formula from Igor last week, um, uh, um, but now you're seeing how it comes about in practice of trying to do it. Yeah. You know? So what we're going to do is we're going to take the oriented diagram and we're going to replace each of its crossings by a source sync orientation. But before I do that, I'm sorry, I, I ran, and because I'm running out of time, my thoughts jumped ahead too quickly. I need to go back here, and then I'll say less. One way that it might occur to you to keep track of things is to say, well, look, the algebra, in order to move it around on the diagram, can be counted as it moves around on the diagram by how many times it goes through virtual crossings. Maybe I can use a trick like that to change one of these X's to a minus X. And a trick like that works, okay? A trick like that works, but we don't count virtual crossings. What we actually count is the discrepancy that occurs in a diagram if you put in source sync orientations at every crossing and then look at the way it will contradict itself globally when you do that. Um, and those are called cut points. And we count the cut points rather than counting the virtual crossings. And we also have to count orderings of states. And when you, uh, when you do that, you see, if you put virtual, if you put source sync orientations in here, then you will get places where the orientations contradict each other. And those are cut points. And sometimes they correspond directly to a virtual crossing. It's true, but it's better to organize with cut points rather than virtual crossing counts. This gives you an index of how, what's going on in there. Um, and then when you confront the same kind of situation that I was talking about before, you look at the algebra locally, you turn it into a local coefficient system, and you watch where, where you started the algebra. Like here, I started the algebra at one, the algebra appears here, but then I transport that algebra for my multiplication to another site and watch whether it goes through cut points or not in the course of that. And that ends up producing the extra signs. Uh, that's enough said. It's a bit intricate, but this uh, schema actually works and the remarkable thing is that it works for uh the lee uh, situation as well which is what i want to get to just to show you that much and then we'll stop so you see first of all the way you produce states 
that have the right properties, if you had a classical diagram using Lee, is to do the following thing. Red going through a crossing turns into green and you color the diagram and that coloring works. And then you get a state by smoothing it in such a way that, um, that the greens continue and the reds continue. And you will find that for a classical crossing, this will hand you a ciphered smoothing for some orientation of a link or the ciphered smoothing in the case of a knot. That works. It's a combinatorics of coloring related to ciphered circles. If you have a virtual knot, it won't work anymore. But if you have a virtual knot and you keep track of the cut points, then it continues to work. The same result works. Once the cut points are in and you color by this Lee method and smooth the crossings, it is the ciphered smoothing. And because it is the ciphered smoothing, the cycles in the Lee algebra that indicate to you what's going on in the Kovana homology by way of that Rasmussen connection, the ones that give you the bound on the genus are related to the cipher, the virtual cipher surface. So that part of the theory generalizes exactly right to let you prove that virtual knots with positive crossings have ciphered genus equal to their four ball genus. And um, I skipped across a lot of things to say that, but I wanted to show you how it was the coloring working right in the Lie algebra uh, that is the technical core of, of this and how that's related to this cut point. And um, I'll stop there. Oh, thanks very much. Um... Uh, Lou, uh, are there any questions? Um, no one wants to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, um, it would be nice to get your notes, uh, as sure. usual. Yeah, because then, then we can go through the skip bits and see if you are pulling our legs or not. Um. <laughs> pulling the wool over our eyes <laughs> i'm sure you weren't <laughs> well yeah i mean uh the the you could ask is this whole theory pulling the wool over your eyes right the the the, the, the all these link homology theories are are somehow long stories in, in the end but i mean as i mentioned last week the, the, these cut points seem to be related you know when you, to uh um a black and white by by course. yes that that's right yeah. that's right yeah so that's it's worth looking at i think but i'm sure people have done that already okay um well no no questions um i, I did have one question but it, it might be naive or overly broad so i, I was trying to think <clears throat> after seeing uh, William's talk from earlier this year. Um, what is it in this intricate mass of combinatorics and algebra that plays the role of a coefficient group in the classical homology theory of spaces? So- Well, uh, um, um, that exactly was the, point I was addressing, right? That we want the coefficient group to be Z, right? Homology with Z coefficients. That, that, well, I, that gives you, right? So mm -hmm. in the ordinary Kovana homology, you get it to be Z coefficients in a way that's very similar to simplicial homology by making the signs alternate in the right way. But is it is it the group Z or is it the algebra with the Right, in the ordinary homology theory, it would be the homology of a point. The zeroth homology of a point is the coefficient group. Um, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Would it be the entire algebra with the... I just haven't, mm -hmm. I haven't read enough of the literature to know if that formalism has been adopted. But when I, when I was looking at William's talk, it struck me that maybe what he was talking about was that a different kind of 
coefficient structure, coefficient algebra in a virtual case? Or, or yeah, well, I, I'm not sure what analogy we want to take. Do we want to think of the circle as a point? I'm not sure the circle should be thought of as a point. So that's the point, <laughs> uh, right? When, I'm, when I have a chain complex in front of me, then I'm just using the analogy, well, I want a coefficient group. I want Z if I can possibly do it. Yeah. But, um, but you're asking a more functorial question about, about it. And I, I, I think it's worth thinking about. So, but there is, I think, I suppose the analogy is, um, in all of these theories, what you assign to a circle is what you assign to the unknot. So I suppose yes. that is the the closest you could get, uh, maybe. The homology of the unknot is what you assign to a circle. So maybe that's the same as saying the homology of a point is uh, the coefficient thing. Yeah, but but there is, as Lou said, there's this functorial question, right? That you want your structure to to give you a theory that expands into the category you want to work with. So maybe there's a different requirement if you're trying to work with virtual links than if you're trying to work with some other category. So again, maybe it's, it's just a naive question. But... Well, yeah, so you want it all to be a, a TQFT, this topological quantum field theory thing, mm -hmm. and which is a functor. And it's just sort of a fact of life that um, as, as Lou described, when when you think about virtual diagrams, there's a new, a new topological phenomenon, the, the single cycle smoothing. And um, yeah, so I suppose that that is, is as you, exactly as you say, it's it, the new requirement. Thank you. You could also go back to the notion of homology of a category, right? Then uh, the, the circle recedes to becoming one possible object. So think of homology of cube categories defined this way, right? Um, then what is the analog of a point? That makes sense. Okay, uh, well, there's obviously a lot of um, thought uh, potential here. Uh, so, uh, but I perhaps will have to bring everything to a close. And thanks again, Lou, for a very interesting talk. And um, there won't be a talk next week because uh, I'm off. Um, and uh, well, unless uh, Lou wants to initiate something on his own, but. Uh, and they, I, I seem to be involved in some conference yeah. next week. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, but in a fortnight's time, uh, Rick's going to give a talk. So uh, we'll look forward to that. And that may be the last talk before the summer break. But we'll see. So see everybody in a fortnight's time. Bye for now. Thank you.